Um, it's been a good day. Have you guys been having a good day? Good. Oh, be talkative. It, people have been far too quiet in some of these talks, so I'm, I'm hoping for a bit more interaction here. Um, and I know I've made a few mistakes, so you know, that, that, that should be good for getting an interaction with the audience. One of the things I've learned today, well, t two, two lessons that I saw repeated through all the talks. Number one is always have a cat picture in your slides. I fail that. I have a bunny picture, but uh, no, no cat picture. And some of the folks watching on the internet, Dan, you know who you are. You should have caught that one in when reviewing these slides. Um, the, the other one is, uh, oh dear, I have an optimistic message. That makes me an idiot, doesn't it? How can I bring an audience like this an optimistic message? But hey, you know, uh, we, we'll see how we get on. We'll see what kind of rocks you want to throw at, at my point about uh, why there's some good news here. Because I want to talk about security metrics that don't suck. Now, um, since, since we published this abstract, I've actually, um, you know, B-Sides always generates lots of firsts for me. I, I've got more feedback from talks done at B-Sides well, well after the show than any other show. And I've had uh, feedback on abstracts that we submitted here before the show even started, before the talk even came up. And a lot of people have gotten in touch with me about this idea that security metrics that don't suck. So hopefully you folks are here because you too are tired of some of the problems in security metrics. I've heard several references to that in talks already today on security metrics being a hard problem. So just to start with the basics, why are security metrics a hard problem? Well, okay, I think a lot of folks here are familiar, but just so we set common ground rules, right? The big problem in security, of course, is if you want to measure security, you're measuring the absence of something happening. And that's fundamentally difficult. What are you going to do? Are you, are you going to publish to your executive board how many days it is since you were last on the cover of the Wall Street Journal? This isn't a very good metric. This isn't going to very, help you very much with justifying the spend you want to do, right? And it's going to be very hard to differentiate one technology from another based on how many days that you're not on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. So measuring security is fundamentally difficult, okay? Not expecting much controversy on that. But unfortunately, we as an industry figured this out quite a few years ago, and we've been talking to ourselves about security metrics for quite a while now, right? And the problem is, a lot of people have tempted to come up with metrics, and I think they found it quite challenging. That is, we, we start talking about, what have we learned from security metrics 1.0? And the first lesson that I think we, that I want to emphasize is, don't measure how fast your treadmill's turning over. Right? We, we, what we find is there was big pressure to measure security. And what did people do? Well, they started looking around saying, okay, I need, to, I, I need to be like those quality guys over in manufacturing or those operations guys who have their availability metrics. I need to do that for my security world. Okay, well, so what, what can we do? What can we count? And the first thing you, you, you find is anything that leaves a record, anything, uh, any process you run. How often do you run your change control process? How often do you update your antivirus signatures? How often do you do things? And we'll measure that. And an awful lot of security metrics, I'll give some examples in a second, just end up being measures of busyness rather than business. Right? And the problem with that is that's just a treadmill metric. So, so watch out for treadmill metrics. They are everywhere. The problem with them, of course, is the reason you wanted metrics, uh, you know, if anybody saw the presentation uh, three ago in, in here with, with, with the decision-making loop for which you need metrics, if you're going to use a metric that measures your busyness, how do you show next quarter or next year you're being successful? Well, let's see, you could go to the executives and show that your, your treadmill is slowing down. That would, that would actually be great, right? If we actually had less security work to do, wouldn't that be fantastic? Except that means you're telling the executive team that you're being lazy. Not good. The alternative is the metric keeps going up. Oh, look, we're doing better and better because our treadmill is faster and faster and faster. This is also the road to hell, right? You don't want to do that. So you have to watch out for these kinds of things. Why? Well, because you've got to think about the way that metrics involve behavior. Now, I'm going to mess up the rhythm of my talk here because I have to just stand here and let you read this for one second. Maybe some of you remember the, this particular Dilbert cartoon from a while ago, but I'll, I'll just give 10 seconds to catch up on that. I mean, for once, the pointy-head boss is trying to do something sensible. What he wants is some quality code, and he imposes a metric program to figure out whether he can get high-quality code. And Wally saying, I'm going to write me a new minivan this afternoon. The, the, you know, always remember those words. If you're thinking about a security metrics program, think about, I'm going to code me a new minivan this afternoon. Right? The, the, this, to me, is, you know, it, it's not just a good Dilbert joke. It's a really profound lesson about metrics. I'm a statistician by background, and we think about these things. And it's really, really important to realize that people react to metrics. Anybody read Freakonomics? Anybody? Yeah, good. Half? Yeah, a book entirely about the fact that in the real world, people's behavior shifts when you measure them. There are plenty of psychological studies on how exactly this works. And so you have to think, if you have a bad metric, you'll get bad behavior, and that will get you a bad outcome, and that's what we're here to stop, right? All of us. So we have to be very, very careful in our security metrics programs not to encourage Wally to code himself a new minivan. 
So as others have observed, we have the problem called the hamster wheel of pain. Um, I think uh, Mr. Jaquith and some of his folks are actually over at Mini Metricon rather than being here at B-Sides, boo hiss on them, but I know some folks have come, come back over here. Um, but here's a recent study. It, it, this, this was work done to go and survey who is doing metrics and who's using which metrics. So to, to folks who have metrics programs they've attempted to do, anybody willing to admit, I'm, I'm not going to call on you for details, but who, who is actually trying to do metrics already? Yeah, nobody wants to put their hand up too far, but, and you recognize any of your metrics on, on this list? Oh, my point is not too hot, right? You notice how an awful lot of them are really just measuring busyness, right? They're just measuring, hey, little incidents here, little incidents there. I mean, so most of these I would criticize as being bad treadmill metrics. And the, the, these fractions are the, the fraction of companies using these. So these are high numbers, right? Um, but my, my favorite is, uh, where is it, Daniel? Intrusion successes. Really? I mean, seriously? Um, either they don't mean what we mean by intrusion or something really weird is going on, or they're getting lots and lots of zeros, right? Well, and... and, and and of course, that, that's one of the easiest metrics to get. How many attempts were there, right? That, that's, that's way up there about intrusion attempts, right? Now, so you get vast numbers of people who are studying that. And that, that, that's a classic hamster wheel of pain metric, right? How often are my alarms going off? Of course, that's the one your alarm vendor told you to use, right? Because it's really, really juicy, right? And anybody not seen when you plug in an intrusion system? Oh, look, a billion attacks prevented. Oh, come on. Am I really going to go to my CFO? and say, hey, if I valued those breaches at a million bucks each and we just prevented three billion of them, come on, right? Anybody who's here two talks ago with the costs of breach, uh, Gillis's talk, right? If you did that kind of math on the alarm rates coming off your IDS, the value of your company has been consumed a thousand times over. Something is wrong with this. This is a security metric that sucks, right? You have to measure something else because we all know stuff happens, right? So what do we want? Well, I claim, like I say, could, could, could be debatable here, but I claim we want to be like the guys over in operations. Everybody in operations, particularly network operations, has an intense focus on a single number. It's availability, right? It's measured in nines. Do you have 99% uptime, 99.9, 99.99? And everybody in that organization worries about that number and nothing else. And so what they have is a closed loop. Um, my, my, my CEO at, at Red Seal is a nuclear physicist, and he recognizes this as control theory, like you'd use in a nuclear power station. You've got to think, think about a negative feedback loop. You have to think about what process and then what control in the process. And availability is a really, really good measure. Those guys, they have it easy over in network operations. They can go to the CFO and say, we are at two nines, and if you spend this much money, we'll get to three nines. If you want to spend that much money, you can get to four nines. Right? What a sweet thing to be able to do. If we could get even close to that kind of clarity in our communication with the rest of the business, we'd be far better off. But, I'm going to go back one, does anybody think these metrics make that point to the business? I certainly don't. I've gone through this list. I don't see a single one there that would help you if you think about what those guys in operations can do. Now, we know the name of what we want. We know it's not availability. We know we have this problem that, that you know, uh, the phone never rings when there's an increase in risk in the organization. Right. The phone rings for availability problems. Right. So those, again, those guys in operations, they have it easy. We unfortunately have to measure risk. We have to measure that things are not happening, we hope, not on a grand scale at least. Many, many small things are, but the really big ones, the black swan events. Right. Uh, people read Black Swan and the Seam Nicholas Taleb, right? the whole thing about, you know, it, it's, it, life is great as a Christmas turkey until that last day. Right. Brilliant insight about this sort of stuff. So, so we have to measure the thing that's insidiously going wrong. And we know its name, we know it's called risk, but it's quite hard to measure. Right? I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have been invited to speak here if we all thought this was an easily solved problem. But let me try and show you some ways to make progress on that, on the risk question. Now, this is about measurements, and I want, I'm going to keep, keep to philosophy for a second. I will eventually get to some specifics about actual calculations to do. But still talking about why do all this, right? Good measurements can tell stories. And which story you want to tell depends on who's involved in the conversation. So obvious members are folks like all of us, right, the team members in security teams. And we've got our friend, the CISO, we hope, hope, hope that's your friend. Um, then there's the conversation outwards to the CFO. And then I've got a fourth participant. I blacked it out here. And any guesses who the fourth participant might be? Shareholders is good. Not the answer I was expecting, and a good one, but not the one I'm, I'm looking for. No? 
Customers, another good guess? No, it, it's a tricky one. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. I was expecting more people to say CEO, but no, I really don't think there's a meaningful conversation about these kinds of scores with the CEO. Even the operations guys can't get the CEO worked up about availability numbers. Right? Everybody thinks, oh, if I just go up the pyramid, all my problems will be solved. It's just not true. Right? Press, interesting angle. Actually, I could do an entire talk on that one, but no, that was not my angle. Good one, though. <laughs> I wish. Uh, life would be so much easier if you wanted to talk to your vendors about risk. I, I, I'd be a happy guy because uh, that's what I do all day. No, okay, so we understand that our com conversations within the security, between the team members and the CISO, right? We, we know what we want risk measures for. We need to prioritize. I've heard that several times in other people's talks who are not even talking about what I, w I was here to talk about, right? We know we are overwhelmed, right? I have, I have never met a security team that said, you know, I'm really short of data. Anybody here want to put their hand up and say, yes, yes, I'm short of data in security? I know there are things we'd love to know, but we're, most organizations I know are drowning in data. And so we need internally within security, we need decent measurements so we can prioritize. We can understand whether to focus, well, two of my particular obsessions are, should we worry about networks? Should we worry about endpoints? Right? There are other decisions about, should I worry about full disk encryption? Should I worry about uh, exfiltration, right? You need prioritization, you need, need ways to measure this. So this is one of the things we want. And of course, because we need a top 10 list, right? We, we're all used to pr the products we surround ourselves with, which I've heard criticized very well today, um, generate phone books. What do you do with a phone book of data? How do you turn that into something meaningful? We'll need measures. And of course, we also should be asking ourselves, and I think anybody coming to a conference like this does ask themselves, are we effective? Right? That's another thing you can do if you design your metrics right. You can actually use them for your own introspection, your own team's introspection about, yes, but does this metric actually show we're being effective or not? Now, of course, there are outbound conversations too, like as you talk out to the rest of the business, the CISO out talking to the CFO, where of course the first line is not, are we being effective, it's not introspection, it's look how effective we're being, right? Very, very important to have measurements that you can use outbound that prove that thing we were worrying about a second ago. You want to be able to show reductions in risk and ideally show why all the money is being spent. I've heard several comments on that during the day as well, because of course you're always going back to ask for more money. Anybody who's not just doing B-sides, we're also going over to RSA. All those damn things cost a lot of money. And we need a way to justify that to the CFO that makes sense. Um, this is going out on the internet, so I be, I, maybe I should be slightly careful about what I say here, but I'm really, really fond of that graphic on the right. Does anybody recognize this? This is the Department of State's uh, measurement pro uh, project called iPost. Uh, there, there are some other names for it as well. Um, and, and I love this uh, because of what it says about the, the, the last two slides. Right? Um, the Department of State, under FISMO, with continuous monitoring, all this pressure, they are the thought leaders in, in the government on this particular point of measure, measure, measure. They do a great job. They really do. And I, I, a lot of credit to them. They've done a fantastic job publishing letter grades for individual embassies because they have no control of the individual embassies. They, they have to centrally figure out, because each embassy is basically its own fiefdom, they have to be able to measure how it's doing. And so they do. They, they actually do an excellent job of some basic parts of measurement. And they can measure and give out letter grades to motivate the various embassy owners, the ambassadors, to spend more and pay more attention to security. And they have indeed had a risk reduction. This is the chart they like to use to prove it. Um, and I do, let me be clear, they have indeed had a risk reduction. But if you can read there, up here, it actually says 89% reduction in red and 90% in blue for the domestic and foreign sites. Well, you wouldn't think the domestic and foreign sites would be very correlated with each other, would you? Shouldn't they be like independent operations? I was just making the point they're all independent. Any statistically savvy graph readers in here, if you look at these two graphs, the lumps and bumps, you see that spike right there, and that one right there, and this one right here, and this one right here, and the way the bumps through here look really an awful lot like that. What the heck is going on? Um, what's happening is they're changing the grade levels. So a large amount of this is actually shifts in the question. Now, now again, the Department of State has done great work on this. They, they were doing this genuinely. They were working with the embassies and trying to get buy-in, right? So another thing about the psychology of metrics, I'm, I'm going way off my intended script here, but I'm, I'm on a good, you know, one slide nine, so I, I can afford this. Um, they actually thought very hard about how to get the embassies to buy in, because if you've tried this, if you've actually tried to measure the business and then report to them, the first thing they, 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 they do is they bristle. Right. They don't want to hear from you guys about what a crappy job they're doing because they all know they're not paying that much attention. Right? They all know they're not as focused on security as you are. So just going in and explaining to them that they get bad grades isn't terribly interesting. So the Department of State thought hard about this problem. And what they did was they, they got the embassies to participate in uh, assessing the grades that were going to be used before they started publishing them. And then as they published them, they tuned up the score because some people said, oh, it's not fair that I got a D grade for this thing over here. That was really unfair. And so they would tweak the scores a bit. And they were doing an excellent job of improving the metric as it went along. But if I look at those scores, I can see that more than I can see the reduction in risk. But 
that's me being picky. The fact is they did an excellent job with the metrics program. They did an excellent job working with the community to get a real change in behavior. And they made some grand claims outwards about the degree of risk reduction that I find a little stretched. But you know, if I get you know, um, sh shuffled into a black car on the way out of here, that's because the Department of State hurdle is live over the internet and they're gonna come get me now. Um, but I, I really think they've done an excellent job with that caveat. So that whole thing about asking the CFO for more money. Uh, well, we know what the CFO wants. CFO wants an ROI. Here we are in TLA speak. They say, I, I spend X, I want to save dollar Y. Have you ever been able to do that? Have you ever been able to show a CFO that sort of thing? What do we do? We tell them the same old FUD stories. Look what happened to Sony. Do you want that to happen to you? Anybody not tired of this yet? It's a stupid game. We have to play it with the CFO. They try and ask us for our financial justifications. We fail to produce them. We produce our FUD stories instead. Ho-hum. They know it's going to happen. We know it's going to happen. It's tedious. Right? We need to do better. So let's get creative. Let's look around. Who else could we call on? I heard several ideas earlier, shareholders, customers, et cetera. My, my claim is, um, have you thought about your insurance agent? Now, are there any insurance professionals in the room? Good, good, good. Um, the, the, the clip art was a little bit rude. Not an actual agent for anyone out on the internet. Real ones are much nicer. But insurance agents, they're interesting people. And you know what? You get right down to it. They know more about risk than we do. We know an awful lot more about security, the S word, but they understand the R word a whole lot better. Right? We like to claim that our domain is so incredibly complicated, but you know, they've seen it all before. Security, the, the, you know, security professionals could learn a lot from engaging with insurance agents, and I'll, I'll, I'll detail this a little bit more. Although I, I was talking about this uh, earlier today, and I was reminded of a point of a book by Doug Hubbard, who, who, who writes uh, to, uh, within this community a, a, about risk, but he's also written a book not aimed at security at all, but aimed out to a general audience about uh, you can measure anything. It's called How to Measure Anything. It's a very good book, Doug Hubbard. Give it a read. Um, in there, he's talking about how to measure intangible things in business, like customer satisfaction and things like this, right? Things that are very, very hard to measure. You know, uh, all the stuff that doesn't have an ROI, right? And we should care about this because we have this problem, right? And we not agreed that we have an ROI problem in security. I mean, Gillis's talk was fantastic on just how much money can blow up, but that's just the Sony FUD story. How often does it happen? Will this spend cause that reduction in risk? We generally can't do that, right? So we need to do better. And this, this is a guy who can help us. Well, let me get back to Hubbard's book for a second in, in How to Measure Anything. He's trying to explain to, to the audience reading his book, who are supposed to be general people in business, about how people resist the idea that some things could be measured, particularly domain experts. Any domain experts in the room? Yeah, one or two. They're very resistant to admitting that their stuff can be measured. And his canonical example of this, one of the leading things in the book, is an IT security professional who wanted to tell him at one of his weekend courses where he teaches people how to do uh, confidence interval estimation. I, I, I'll try not to get the details of that. Um, he tries to, to educate this guy on, look, you, you do know more about this, and, and I, I can't afford to repeat the whole thesis of the book, but, it, but it, it's good. Um, and this guy said, no, no, security is far too complicated. You don't understand all the stuff we have to worry about in IT security. It's so complicated. There's so many moving parts. The evolving threat landscape, yada, 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 yada. And the guy said, oh, Hubbard asked him, where do you work? Oh, I'm in the IT shop at a large insurance firm. Dude, all those people that you are doing that security for, all those insurance professionals, what do you think they do all day? They estimate risk for things that are really hard. I mean, heck, they insure people. You really seriously want to tell me your computers are more complicated than those people? when we write insurance policies and we don't have all the facts and they change their behavior as we write the policy and as we adjust the claims. And seriously? You really want to tell us a, uh, an insurance professional that, oh no, my world's too complicated. So I think we should take these people seriously and they are increasingly taking us seriously. Right? Data breach insurance is more commonly available. I'm, I'm tracking this out, out in the insurance industry. Is, is it, anybody comfortable with the data breach insurance they have today? Anybody know whether they've got any? Yeah, a couple of folks. So good. I mean, I, I am seeing it come out there, and from the figures I can see from the insurance side, they're trying to figure out which policies they can sell us. They're, they're, uh, some of the early evidence is they can make some good money here. They can see a real risk opportunity here. Um, because they, they, what they want is a risk transfer market. They want to find people who want to give away risk and will pay to do so. You guys match that description at all? Right? And there's a very good reason to transfer risk to these people. Right? I, I, I can't go all the way off into history of insurance and ships and Scottish widows and so on. But th th there, there are some very important lessons from all that world for us. It's about transfer. It's about pooling risk. It's about when you don't know what's going to happen. If you don't know your ship's going to sink, 
insurance is a really good way for all of us ship owners to get together and pool that so that we can all withstand the horrible things that happen to us. But there's another factor. There's a second bullet I've got here. I had entire slides on this that I had to cut for time. They're in the appendix. But the insurance agents represent companies that don't have the transparency problem we all have. I've heard a couple of references, uh, back to Gillis' talking, where somebody asked about, how can we get more transparency? How can we understand more about the breaches that are happening to other people? Hard problem. Insurance companies don't have that problem. Insurance companies write policies, and they get the best data possible. They get to say, for which instance did they have to pay out data? So did they pay out money because of the data loss? So when did they have to pay out money? To whom did they have to pay out money? And what were the behaviors of the people to whom they had to pay out that money? Ah, oh, well, this is interesting because they see all these breaches, not just yours. If you compare it to car insurance, right? We'll drive cars, well, m most folks here drive cars. Your, your regular person's uh, lifetime car accident expectation is about one in very raw, raw, raw numbers. So you can expect about one significant car accident in your lifetime. I, I've had mine. I hope I don't have another one. But that means I have very little information on whether you know, uh, mid-window rear brake lights impact security or uh, impact crash risk or not. Right? I can't get that data. My insurance company can. They can study what's going on. They can look at all the various accidents. They can understand, hey, the cars that had anti-lock brakes were a little bit safer about this much because they can see all the incidents. And you can't do that. I can't do that. I visit an awful lot of companies, and I can see a lot through Red Seal. I can see a lot of their posture. I can understand a lot about who's, who runs a good operation and who runs a bad operation. That's part of what I do for a living. But I still don't get the incident data because the companies won't tell me. And they won't tell you guys either. And I've heard many people complaining today about the fact that we can't get this data. The insurance companies won't give it to you either, but at least they've got it. So if we can work with the insurance companies they can learn what works. And now, if you haven't read ahead already, all the studies say people always read your slides before you even get there. The argument with the CFO is the CFO might finally have that light bulb moment about what this is about. Good security is that which reduces my insurance premium. You might not have to go straight to a one-to-one, -one, right? I don't want, don't want to be too picky about that. But at least imagine being able to talk to the CFO with a straight face and say, I will save you money. I may save you money out of here, and I may need to spend a little more over there. We, we, we know that's going to be a little bit tricky. But at least to be able to get to that kind of conversation with the CFO would be an excellent improvement for us as an industry. So my, my suggestion, my, my positive message is, is surround the CFO. Work with your insurance agent. Start asking questions about data breach insurance. It doesn't cover everything. It doesn't cover everything we're here worried about at this conference. But it's good stuff. And there are very good reasons to think that this might help you justify what else you want to do. Because particularly, imagine if you could actually uh, negotiate. Uh, the, the other thing, uh, because it's a nascent industry, there's a lot of haggling, right? This is not like buying car insurance, you know, insurance and all, all, all that's all very entertaining. But premiums are more or less well established. People know what anti-lock brakes are worth, insurance professionals. They know the risk reduction from anti-lock brakes. But they don't really know this stuff yet. So if you could demonstrate that you have superior hygiene to the next guy, you can actually negotiate a meaningful discount. And this is a very healthy conversation to be having. This is a good, good conversation with the CFO. And you know what? If we did this just right, if we, if we could actually work with those insurance professionals and get a sense of, hey, these technologies work and those don't. I've, I've heard several claims today about that technology over there sucks. That technology over there doesn't work. Well, we actually have ways to quantify that here, right? Not just PCI says I must do it, but no, my insurance agent says no, I must do it. Now, that's different, right? That's di significant difference in meaning between those two. Anyway. Too much philosophy. Some people are starting to nod off because I'm not talking about metrics enough. So time to start talking about metrics. Anybody actually old enough to remember this? Uh, yeah. yeah, OK, good, good, good. Wanted to, just wanted to make sure no, nobody had fallen asleep. So let's talk about ways to measure meaningful posture. So just so we get the pieces out on the table and get everybody clear about what we're going to talk about, everybody's got some assets you need to protect. Right? Everybody's got some. It could be uh, personally identifying information. It could be intellectual property. Some of it is really mission critical. Some of it, people will die if you mishandle it or a bad thing happens to it. Um, and th th those folks tend to be more focused on, on these kinds of problems. But that doesn't mean they have massively superior environments, I find. I, I study these for a living. And um, yeah, I see some pretty wacky uh, mission critical, you know, life critical environments out there. We, we know there are vulnerabilities. Bad guys exploit them, so we scan. Now, again, I've heard some good stuff today on the weaknesses of vulnerability mapping, but at least tracking the known knowns is an accepted practice. It's not everything. You know, we're here at a conference like this because we know that's not everything, but it's a damn good data source, at least of the known knowns, that we should be taking care of. 
And we have countermeasures like firewalls at the most basic level and moving up to fancier and fancier levels. So we have to think about how these things combine. And I, I don't have a, um, a cat picture, but I do have a bunny picture. So half, half points, I hope. So the trick is to attack. The trick is to attack the environment. Um, we, we've heard a uh, conversation earlier today on, on pen testers. Well, you want to know your defensive posture. If you could measure your defensive posture, that's half of the risk equation solved. It's not the whole thing. You'd also need incidence data, that thing I'm saying the insurers can get. And if we could come to the table with posture awareness, because we understand the technical gear a whole lot better than they do. They don't really know what a firewall is. It's not their job. They understand risk, and they understand you know, actuarial tables. And if we can show them our defensive posture and they can measure the incidence data, then we could actually pull off an interesting dance here. So our job is establish defensive posture. It means we've got to find the weak points, so we want to attack just like the rabid bunny. And we want to measure ease of compromise. And by the way, by the way there are some standards along the way to help, and standards are good things. So, so, we'll, so we'll try to use those. So what do I mean by attack? Well, if you can model the environment, what you're worried about is the bad guy getting to the bug. Everybody asks me, what's the Black Widow for? I haven't had a better way to show a bug yet. OK, so the bad guy is going to try and reach the bug. And if he can do so, that's a problem. OK, I know I'm doing baby talk for you guys, but bear with me for a second. I'll get into something a bit more quantified. You put in some countermeasure, something to block it to make a low risk situation. The bad guy being not stupid, that's the whole point, will find a way to pivot around. And so now you've got this very complicated chess game where if they can find any path in, you've got a problem. You have to find every path to be able to stop them. They only need one, an unfair game, because you need to go and block every possible path. OK, so it's a tough chess game, right? It's harder on you than it is on the attacker. So you need some way to measure all this stuff. All right, uh, let me do an example quickly. This is a, a real corporate organization. Um, there's an internet cloud up over there on the left in red. They've got a DMZ out here because they're a good organization. It's fairly large, actually. So each one of these little gray things is a separate subnet. Each one of the denser blue dots is a router. So that's a fairly large DMZ. Right? That's a quite big environment. That's actually almost a company-sized thing on its own. So this is a pretty major presence. And then this is actually the rest of the corporate site back here. So a fairly large corporation. And this is actually only one of their sites. Um, but what they want to do is attack this. They want to do a sample attack chain to understand their environment. OK, so um, how do you do that? Well, you can do some calculations to say what access is there, and then which vulnerabilities could you reach down these paths. So you're looking at the firewalls, the countermeasures, the, the other things that can block uh, attacks. And you look at, OK, where can you get from the internet? And you find an answer like this. And this is good. This means they built the DMZ for a reason, right? We, we know why we build DMZs. We want to push all that ooky stuff out to the edge there. These guys did a good job of that. So yes, they had a working DMZ. Many times I'll come into a company and all the red goes that way, right? But not here. This is actually fairly well done. But in that set, are any of these important? What would an attacker do? Right? That's what we need on T-shirts. What would the attacker do? Um, well, one of these is much more serious than all the rest. It's a little hard to see here. But one of those attack points where you come in from the internet and you hit a machine over here, there's now a second attack vector from there going all the way over here. And from there, you can fan out and do more or less whatever you want. Right? So that's attack chain simulation. That's the methodology I want to talk about. Now, of course, I'm doing this at high scale with some software, but you can use this in smaller environments. This is not vendor pitch. I'm trying to talk about a methodology here of how you could do this, and I'm, I'm going to give away some of how we do this, at least, mechanically in, in, the, in the calculations. So um, the summary result, then, after you do an attack, is you start this actual picture we draw. Of, you start on the outside. You've got this attack surface. From there, we can compromise this much your organization. And the good news, if you've got a picture like this, is that much the organization is safe. Many organizations to start out with don't have a very big green beach ball. But some do, so some do better than others, and the objective over time is to get the stuff in there. OK, that is a conversation about operational security, about how you could prioritize within the security team. I haven't said anything about metrics yet. OK, so I just wanted that as ground rules, and now I want to talk about, OK, now measuring this. How can you, how can you extract a measurement from doing all this kind of work? And this is a fairly complicated slide, but I did promise some, some beef on how to do some calculations. You know, my, my, my company, Red Seal, we've taken over $40 million worth of funding. This is $40 million worth of math on this slide, and it's really simple to do, right? It's a little hard to scale, uh, so I do actually have a company for a reason. But if you wanted to use a methodology like this, if you wanted to think about calculations, you can steal my ideas. I've published, you know, they're not uniquely mine, but you can steal my company's ideas, right? So publishing here a mechanical way to measure the significance of an attack. Now, I have to be very careful. I know there are some folks in here. Yes, you can have a copy of these slides. I see people sh shooting pictures of it. Um, so I want to be very, very careful because I know some people in here, as soon as they have that word up there, I, I, I posted something the other day about you know, today's definition of risk, using the word risk in, a slide, in front of an audience like this. But I want to tread very carefully here, and there is a jump between the first line and the second line. So I'm, I'm going to emphasize that for the folks who track the details. If you're not worried about this philosophy so much, uh, bear with me for a second. So 
all statisticians will agree with, with this top line, right? The risk is always, you know, it's the expected value calculation. It's the probability of the bad thing happening times the damage you take if that bad thing happens. Right, that's straightforward. Everybody agrees with that. But then how exactly you measure that is where all the art comes in. Right? This is, there actually is no debate about the formula for risk. There's some small semantic finery of, 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 of some variations. But the trick is how you proxy these values if you haven't got them. Right? So the actual dollar value of that web server over there, not, not a sheet metal and silicon, but value to the business, we all know we can't do that. Right? So we can't directly get value. We have to use proxies for value. Likewise, I already, I already conceded probability of an incident. Okay, if you know you have this vulnerability over here, what is the probability of a bad guy coming tomorrow and taking you down with that? Anybody think they know that? Anybody think for a vulnerability you can actually assess the probability of exploit? I know some people do study this sort of stuff, so I might find some folks. Nobody's quite willing to extend that claim. Okay, so we have to use a proxy again. So the proxy I'm going to suggest is, we, we refer to this as exposure. This is where I'm starting to give away company secrets. So we, what we need to do is we need a proxy for value. Okay, we, we, we use a 1 to 100 scale because we find nobody can do dollar value. Nobody can say that machine is worth a million dollars. There are people who can say downtime of this sort on that machine is worth so many transaction volumes, so many billion dollars a second. But that still doesn't get you into reputation risk, all the stuff we, you know, that we all as an industry think about. So we put in a proxy, um, sometimes referred to as a job's worth. Yeah, on a 1 to 100 scale, you set the machines to 100 if they're worth more than your job is. Right? That's, that's a job's worth. That's a, a, a unit value of 100 on the scale. Um, so we, we, we allocate values to hosts based on uh, the application values that we see there on this relative scale with the default that the databases tend to be the juicy stuff. Good basic rule to start with. You can tune from there to your heart's content, and anybody here can do it. And then we use this CVSS standard, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Right? Everybody is familiar with CVEs through SCAP, through the NVD, and the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, it's a framework. Not all the values in every single vulnerability are tuned to the umpteenth degree, but you do have the right to change it yourself. You don't have to agree. They even have a slot in there where you can tune it yourself called the environmental metric. Um, so, but just to keep life simple, I'm going to do a, a, sh a simple example of how to use this. So if you allocate value to hosts and you've got a CVSS score, let's at least take this as a proxy of how bad the vulnerability is. Right? Now, I, I clearly can't get a time-based component. That's what I'm saying the insurance guys could come help us all with. So I don't have that time-based component, but I can use this as a measure. You know, that's a doozy. A CVSS 9 on your internet-facing environment would suck. Okay, so let's call that an exposure of 0.9, and that means I get a risk proxy score here of 68. I go down to the next machine, and he's, got, he's, a, he's a jobs worth, right? There's a value of 100 jobs worth, but he's only got a CVSS 6. Now, in his case, what we're going to use is the 0.6 from the CVSS. We're going to multiply it by the strength of the ease of attack to get in here. So if this guy is easily to expose, then this guy is correspondingly easy to expose. Right? So it's a chain of attack. So it is very, very simple math. It's just simply saying start with an attack intensity of 1 and then multiply by normalized CVSS values. So, so you get an exposure of 0.9 here. You multiply that 0.9 for the first guy by the 0.6 on the second guy. And this guy is 0.9 by 0.6 by 0.3. And then you can multiply each one of these by the value of the asset, and you get these scores like 3 here, 54 here, and 68 there. Tends to be higher risk towards the outside, but you'll actually find that the internal assets that are really juicy, the crown jewels, will hike way up when, when you do this because, uh, you know, crown jewels in the middle of the castle, if those can be stolen, that's bad news. That's why that score picks up. There's another calculation on here that I didn't mention. That's this blue thing, downstream risk. All that's happening there, you can see it's just adding up everybody down in the graph. Right? The idea, idea there is just... Quick, quick point, if you measure risk and you always figure out, okay, here's my castle, here's the crown jewels in the middle of the castle, oh look, the crown jewels are at risk. That tells you you have a problem, it doesn't tell you what to do. We've generally found that in most environments, a downstream risk measure is a better way to figure out what to do. Downstream risk will, will, will notice things like a forgotten FTP server, or um, not, not thinking of any hotlines in particular, an HR web server where some SQL injection could allow somebody to inject something into the back end. Right? So a forgotten resource like that would have high downstream risk because it's not such a valuable asset, but you can use it as a path to get into other things. Right? So that's what the blue calculation picks up. All right? So I promised some mathematics. That's, a math, that's an example of a way to do this kind of calculation. And as I say, I'm, I'm giving away the, you know, uh, the, the, how we do this. It's a little difficult to scale that to 100,000 hosts. So we, we do come along with software. Yes, I do make software. I make software to do stuff like that and take in vulnerability data about your network, your scanner, all that stuff, your, your, all those phone books that you're buried in. And I'll crank it through this model using the NVD as a data source. Uh, we package that in a thing called the TRL. I'm not even going to talk about this inferred stuff over here. We crank that through a calculation, and we come up with a risk map. It looks kind of like that. It's, it shows red things where you've got problems, and then you can pivot it and say, okay, 
okay, I know that the crown jewels can get broken into, but now what do I do? You can pivot and say, well, where do I have high downstream risk? What are the most important defects in the castle wall that will allow the bad guys in instead of focusing on the crown jewels all the time? Okay. So, regardless of whether you like my software for doing this or not, the point of the, the methodology here is this approach can be rolled up to give you meaningful scores. And we are finding this is very effective for people. This is a, a, a real shot of uh, the, how the, the product packages this up. Uh, it's, it's unfortunately not real data. Uh, I do have tiny samples of some real data, but of course it's very hard for me to disclose some of that for some of the reasons you know very well. Um, but what we're trying to measure here is that overall risk score now, of course, I know some people in the audience know more than enough about risk to know that what I strictly have there is a proxy for risk because I had to proxy the value score and I had to proxy the probability of exploit. Yes, I confess, that is an overall proxy risk score if you want to be picky. You, know, um, you can throw things at me later if you, if you even object to that characterization. But at least it's trying to measure how easily a bad guy could get in. That is a measure you can at least talk within the security team about, but you can also talk outside about, ah, we spent all this money and a drop like that happened. Of course, if you spend all that money and that happened, that's not so good, right? We can then break that down into, we can separate it out into measurements, right? If, if, if you're tracking the mathematics of what it did, it's actually a relatively decomposable score. You can decompose it into, okay, well, uh, where do I have issues on the uh, attack surface side uh, that, that, uh, that, that are in the network? And then when do I have those in the host side? I mentioned that dis di distinction earlier, right? That usually reflects back to silos of work inside organizations. So you have to know, you know which phone number to call when you know you've got a problem. Right, so you have to be able to break that down. And you can never do anything about any of this without talking compliance. That's why there's a compliance bit at the end there. That's your PCI status or any other standards you want to use for whether or not you're following uh, network security standards, PCI section one, if you're really deep into that stuff. You can also use these trend lines. I think I already mentioned this about whether or not the investments are working and to focus on where you need to improve. Right, so all of that in one page. And again, my point is to try and show you a methodology. I don't care if you do it my way. What I do care about is that you attempt to measure for an objective that get, heads towards the right outcomes. That is, con concluding, I claim defensive posture can be measured. You can vary it to, to, to other methods of the ones I've used, but it is critical to start measuring this, to not be stuck on the hamster wheel of pain where we're just measuring that we're being busy. We need to measure things that can drive to better outcomes, and if we can measure posture, that will improve our posture instead of just making the, the, the hamster wheel run faster and faster and faster. I, I can claim real instances where it does help the CFO's light bulb to, to go on. And ultimate objective, we can sleep better. These are my grand claims. Arguments. Is it too warm in here? I see people nodding. Yes. Sure. Um, the, the question is about can you use this operationally, not just, if, don't let me put words in your mouth, but, but, but uh, you know, we often call this proactive, right? Proactive security intelligence is the uh, blurb for this. Um, then the point is, of course, you're doing that ahead of the attack. You're behaving more like a fire marshal than a fire alarm, right? The, the idea of noticing, hey, you've got a whole bunch of burnable material next to the lift shaft there. Don't do that as opposed to burglar alarms that go off when, or you know, fire alarms that go off when the building's on fire. So if you do have a fire alarm going off, what use is this other stuff, right? Is that a fair summary of the question? Yes, so, so operationally what we find is today, this is often a swivel chair, right? Uh, the, 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 there are quite a few uh, socks you can go into where you can see something like what I do, the proactive stuff up on one screen, and then on this other screen over here you've got the event stuff going on. The trick is to do the proactive stuff, you have to map the environment really, really well, right? Sun Tzu's all about, you know, know the terrain and know yourself before you worry about the enemy, right? So, so, so the space that I'm in, the kind of vendors who do this, we're all focused on that, on the Sun Tzu point of know the terrain. Now, of course, is, that, is knowing the terrain useful when you know their cavalry are charging through over here? Well, yeah, it is kind of useful, but it, I'll be very straightforward. It, today, it's a very much a swivel chair kind of thing. So people do pick up live events and say, oh, okay, A is attacking B. Well, is that going to work? Is there a countermeasure in the way? Uh, if they get to B, where can they get downstream from B? These are good questions to ask your, your mapping and proactive vendor rather than your alarm vendor, because the alarm vendor is just trying to deal with the fire hose of junk coming at them, right? So the kinds of measurements here, now, I don't think the risk metrics have, have proven so effective for operational response, but the preconditions for them have. It's one of the funny things. Right? To be able to get these risk metrics out, you have to actually be standing on a reasonably clean operational model. And that, fundamentally, the map of the terrain is the thing that helps. Um, in fact, I, if I could even run with that for, for, for one second, um, 
I, I have a suspicion, but th this is absolutely unproven. Right? Most of the stuff up here is solid, demonstrable stuff today. But I have a suspicion that if we really get straight with those insurance guys about what they want to see, I'm not sure they ultimately need a measure of how easily somebody could break in an attack. What they could really use is knowing whether you know. Because if you're the kind of organization who can do these measurements that I'm talking about, if you have the data quality, almost regardless of what the measurements say, you're on top of your game. You've measured the environment. You've worked with the guys over network operations. You actually could map your environment. You've actually got Voln scanning, and you can prove that it's got good coverage of the environment. Right? One of the routine findings we have when we, when we help people do this is, as you saw, if I go all the way back to my inputs, right, you need to gather countermeasure stuff, network stuff, firewalls, stuff like that, and vulnerability data. Well, that, those are two different data silos. They've been operating completely in isolation in most organizations until people like us show up. Okay, you take these two data silos, you pour the two of them together, what do you find? They don't map together at all. <laughs> I, I, I do this hand gesture a lot. Right? There's, there's a whole bunch of scan data that doesn't fall in the network, and there's a whole bunch of network that costs an awful lot of money that seems to have no hosts in it. What's that about? Right? So to even ask the questions I'm talking about, I've stepped through a couple of early, earlier levels of maturity about just even mapping the environment. Right? The, the military types, do, do you call it you know, situational awareness, force accounting, terrain mapping? Exactly those principles play out very well here. If you can do those principles well, then during incident response, you will be a far better incident responder. Ultimately, it's not the metrics that do that. It's the preconditions of those metrics. If you can get that data, and if you can understand it, then you can respond to incidents better. Yes? Yeah, 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 if you block the light, then I can see. Um, so how do you map this uh, model over risk and managing it? I mean, who are the vendors that are making the product rather than someone who's using it? Well, how do I find out how effective these things are? Well, how... No, I mean, you know, basically you talk about insurance, mm -hmm. but uh, software, insurance reps, uh, the people who make the software are liable for anything. Oh, yeah, I'm not saying that's right, but that's the way it is in the industry. Oh, yeah, yeah yes. So th this is why I, I do think it's good to go back and look at what the insurance uh, companies are doing and what they're not doing. Because you, you're right, they do not yet do everything. But what they are doing is useful, right? The data breach insurance, sometimes called data privacy insurance, it is certainly not covering everything we worry about. But I don't think it's going to get better unless we engage with those guys. They're not worried about your EULA when you broke the shrink wrap. They're worried holistically about your business, right? They already insure your business against workman's comp issues. That's some guy falling down on the job and breaking their leg, right? And where were the EULAs? You know, who, who's, who's liabilities? Yeah, insurance company ultimately doesn't care. They care about what kind of business you're in and what's the probability of somebody suffering a serious injury in that, in that business. And they have ways of measuring that. They have ways of figuring out your premiums based on whether or not there's a whole lot of heavy lifting in your company, right? So the insurance companies, if you, if you want to talk to me, if, if my message here makes any sense at all, if you want to talk to those insurance companies, they're going to come at you holistically. They're not going to worry about the minutiae of what exactly you've agreed to between you and the various other vendors. They're just going to say there are costs here if a breach occurs, notification costs, paying for all those uh, you know, uh, credit protection services, all that kind of stuff. We can insure you against those costs, but to, to buy this insurance, it's already true. To, to buy this insurance, you have to pass a very, very basic qualification. You can't just go out on the street and buy this stuff. You have to at least demonstrate that you, that you can fog a mirror in, in security terms, right? Because, you know, they're not crazy, these guys. They're not in the charity business, right? We're all clear about that, right? So, so, so they're, not, they're not coming along to solve your problem. They're coming along to make a profit. So you will have to demonstrate that you can fog a mirror. But they do not care about the finer points. They only care at a high level about whether you're in a high-risk business and are you able to do meaningful security things. So I, I, I hope I'm not misinterpreting your question, but, but if, we, if we plow into, oh, but is it our liability or that other software vendor's liability or da 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 da, da that's a lawyer question. That's not an insurance question. Feel free to throw things if you still disagree. Yes? Hmm. Yeah.
Yeah, no, th that, that's an excellent question, that, and, that, and that is a good catch. I think this slide even has the worst word on it. Yes, it has the worst possible word on it. I thought it did. Sorry, this is a freshly built slide, and you, you, you are dead right. Um, it, w when I go back and ed edit this, sorry, Bob, if Bob is watching, um, that word right there, um, yeah, that's where a lot of people start, but you're dead right. That's, that's not all there is to this, right? Um, I, I just find in most organizations, if we try and model their environment, if I ask the security professionals, what are you worried about? You know, if I give them a tool to mark threat sources, they go crazy. They go like a three-year-old with a rubber stamp. Bom, 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 bom. Everything is a threat source. And the problem with that is you don't get any quality of metri metric out of that. You have to have some degree of differentiation. So um, you need to be able to improve resolution. So my practical methodology for people is start with something simple and basic that everybody, including the CFO, can agree. Let's start with just your internet feed. That does not mean that's the be-all and end of the question. You are dead right. That is a fault on this slide because it implies this is purely about a prior to deperimeterization world. world. What, what would we call that? A perimeterized world? Uh, you know, it's, it's a, what's postmodern anyway? Um, so yes, you can use this methodology and substitute your own uh, you know, uh, monster under the bed into that red cloud, and you can use the same calculation. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm pointing out how the calculation's done in hopes it's useful to you. But of course, it depends critically. The results you get do depend critically on how you set that. G going back to where I was being rude about the Department of State, right? I do love their tr the trend lines just because they, there's so many stories in them. But uh, of course, that, that point I made that you know, this drop here appears to be a change in the rules, not a change in reality. That happens too. Of course, if you took a model like mine and you were only worried about internet, and then you say, OK, now I want to do wireless. I still worry that wireless is too easy to compromise. So I'm going to go stamp, 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 and go say all my wireless egress points scare me. You can absolutely do that, and you'll get the reverse of one of those. You, you get one of these things, right? You can absolutely take whatever paranoid stance you want. I'm just saying that my experience as I go security team to security team is it's a very bad idea to ask a security team to list the things they're worried about because it's everything, right? So you have to start somewhere. So I'm, I, I'm, I hope I'm not being at all evasive on that. It, it is a complicated question. Um, I, do, I do recommend narrow focus to start with, even if it makes it sound like you're not being paranoid enough. Yes? Mm. That, another very good question. You know, what, what happens if you run this engine backwards and try and figure out what it could tell you if instead of imposing from the, from the get-go which are the valuable assets, try and figure out from, say, the stance in the graph which the, the juicy points are? And I'll tell you what, yes, and it doesn't tend to find mission-critical assets. Mission-critical assets actually tend to have relatively limited attack service. What it finds more than anything else is your antivirus servers or your network operation center. The true nerve centers, right? The things that can connect anywhere so that a vuln in that spot is so much more devastating, right? You know, you need every place in your organization to be able to reach your antivirus server, right? Well, okay, but most people end up writing this both ways to say the antivirus server can also go anywhere, which means the vulnerability there is game over, right? And, and so, I, yes, yes, I've attempted some graph analytics like that. I did not find business valuable assets. What I found was people not thinking hard, hard enough about zone defense, which, by, by the way, is another point earlier about what if the zone's going to break down? PCI has some great principles in it. Again, I don't know if that's a controversial opinion around here, but I do think PCI Section 1 has a very good zone definition of you've got to keep the place where you've got my money, right? Those credit card companies, you've got my money in your network. It needs to be in a box. There needs to be DMZ separating that box from the outside world. Very, very simple. That, that is a good design of defense in depth. I, I do think, shocking though this may, may seem, some movements in regulation are helping us improve security because they're forcing us to finally spend the money for the de defense in depth that we've been talking about for decades in this game. But that will be the start of a whole new talk, so I should cut that one off. Okay, second job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly right. Some of the segmentation thinking and the virtualization groups they've got going on are doing some good work on that, on that right now. So, so yes, seg segmentation is key. I'll be doing a whole talk at IANS on that, and it's well beyond my topic here that was only supposed to be giving away how to do metrics. Uh, maybe one more. I have a two-minute warning. Sure. So everything I've said is vaguely related to the talk too. So, yes. 
Yes, yes. and um, that, that, is, that is a very sensible inference on the picture. The claim is, you know, anytime you see two graphs as, as tightly correlated as, as, as that pair, um, that, it, that it looks like double counting. Um, I, think, I think that's a wise comment on the graph. I have both stared at this graph, the report behind it, and I know something about the people who made the data, and I actually don't think that's true in this case. I think that's a smart observation, but uh, th 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 there's, of course, there's the data, and then there's a the standard used to measure the data, and I really do think in this one it's the, the fact that they were shifting the standards. Plus, they're not that tightly correlated. Even when you account for the way the scale is built here, um, some of the falls here don't quite map out down here quite as clearly. So that, 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 that's a very good suspicion about the data, but the, the way embassies work, they really are massively isolated from each other. And, and the, the work that went on here to make sure everybody agreed the yardstick was fair actually was a good way to address that problem. They'd actually done pretty good data hygiene to say the stuff from the embassy in Bahrain is only the stuff in Bahrain. Right? So they actually had reasonably good controls of that. But, but yeah, that's a very good paranoia looking at the picture, yes. and they'll be highly, highly correlated. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Fundamentally, the thing that made me suspicious in the first place was exactly doing that, that visual mental math. That if you scaled them to, to, together, they, they, they're far too correlated. Um, they, they, they haven't said what they're doing at the moment. Um, you can barely read it here, but that, that scaled in there is actually, this is all data through 2009, and if you read the reports these things come out in, you can see that's only when they started, right? So, any metrics program, you know, th this isn't my advice, this is a book by Doug Dexter, uh, has a nice comment about this, and it, right? you, you know baseline's gonna be grim. Right? If you measure anything, you're not gonna publish the results of the first three months because you'll be learning how to do it. Right? It's gonna be a mess like this, it's gonna be falling all over the place, going up, going down, looking like the graphs I had from, from my product. That sort of stuff goes on, and you need a way to say, okay, Kachunk, it's now, this, you know, we've now baseline, we've gotten to a stable set of standards. The, the thing I'm harping about here is you know they, pub they publish data here from before they'd really stabilize the standards, so that they don't re revise them as fast anymore. They, and you know, honestly, I don't think they're cheating. I just think there's a defect that the paranoid can perceive in this data. I really do think they've actually improved the security of the State Department by measuring, and frankly, the name and shame. That's been quite effective for them. Yeah. Ah. Th th that is exactly right, yeah, I mean, and, and the CVSS standard that I've been talking about, that, that particularly has a knob in there that you can tune, that you're supposed to use for exactly this purpose. I have yet to find a single enterprise doing so, but there are indeed folks in government who do precisely that. That's exactly what you're picking up on. And it's, they, they, they do indeed. We, we, we harvest them from the NVD, we republish them out to our user base, so they've picked that up without effort. But most people are so overwhelmed that they're not actually in the business of tweaking the, the CVSS environmental score themselves. So they, they just want the automatic stuff, but you're dead right. The uh, Department of State does have people who are doing that, and that will cause tweaks in the number. So, so of course, do Microsoft patch Tuesdays. Right? Anytime you do this, you will get correlation of, oh, dear, it was Tuesday. Right? That absolutely happens. I think that's my time out. Thank you so much.